Welcome to this Palooza Deep Dive featuring Ohio Literacy Lead Michelle Elia. Hi everyone, I'm David Brobeck from Walsh University and welcome to today's Deep Dive, a spin-off from the Palooza that was held last month and we are very pleased today to welcome to the air Michelle Elia, Ohio Literacy Lead. Michelle, welcome. Thank you. Hi everybody. Um, I see we have a few more people in the waiting room. We're going to let them in. I'm super excited to present on this topic. This was a session that I did for ODE, for our Literacy Academy. And so I'm going to repeat it here and try to condense it down to an hour. It was originally an hour and a half presentation. So if I go quickly through some sessions, know that sections, know that this will be recorded so that you can access it later. And I apologize in advance. Um, for going so fast. <laughs> but those of you who know me know that, well, that's kind of how I talk anyway. <laughs> I'm putting the slides, um, the PDF of the slides, into the chat box so that you can access that if you'd like to download it. But I'm going to go ahead and get started. I also encourage you to follow me on Twitter at Michelle J. Elia. It's in the chat box. And tweet about this experience or just follow me because I tweet all kinds of fabulous things about literacy and education. And I'd love to hear from you as well. I'm falling back. Let's get started. The reading brain, what every educator needs to know. A couple webinar norms. Be an active participant. Engage in all of the um, questions, comments. We want to hear your voice. Um, feel free to raise your hand or just interrupt if you have a question. And let's have fun uh, because it should be in interactive and engaging for all of us. Uh, that's how we learn is by talking and communicating and um, really just having a great discussion about the content. So I encourage that. What are we going to do? We're going to examine the reading process that happens within the brain. Stanislaw Dehan says, it is untrue that there are multiple ways to teach children how to read. Um, the brain has one way of learning. This is my new brain, isn't it cute? <laughs> the brain has one way of learning to read and we need to make sure that we teach to that. So let's talk about what's going on in the brain. We'll discover the role of phonology, orthography, and meaning in a reading brain. Categorize and apply these practices um, to, um, to within the four-part processing system so that you can see how to use that um, theoretical model which really outlines the regions in the brain uh, to plan your instruction and we'll debunk myths and that's one of my favorite parts of today is debunking the myths associated with teaching reading using neuroscience which is quite frankly what we should be doing so to get things started i have a quick question that i'm going to ask you to orally respond to um, in order to do that quickly, you can press and hold the space bar um, in order to respond. So I, since there's a small group, I'm going to put some pressure on you. Um, if a child is surrounded by spoken language, will they learn to talk? Press and hold your space bar. Respond yes or no. Go. Yes. 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 Absolutely. That is a yes. We can, by, through immersion in oral language, most children, not all, we know we have some children who are nonverbal, but most children through immersion in oral language will learn to talk. Now, conversely, if a child is surrounded by books, by immersing them in a culture of books, reading to them constantly from a very young age, will they learn to read? Yes or no? No. 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 And that's one of the first myths we're debunking today because um, if you've watched the um, documentary, Our Dyslexic Children, which actually takes place here in Ohio, um, one of the things that the parents indicated was that they were told that if they would just read to their child more and, and surround them with more great books, their children would learn to read. And that's a myth. Um, surrounding children by great books is not going to be enough to teach them how to read. Um, reading, it, teaching reading is rocket science, and we need to make sure as educators we know the science so that we can teach kids to read appropriately. So the big takeaway here is that the brain is not wired to read naturally. We need to train the brain to learn to read, and that makes us neurosurgeons. So um, next time you are talking to your colleagues, you can say, yes, I'm a teacher, but I'm also a neurosurgeon because I rewire the brain, ensuring that all these parts are working beautifully. I focus on the left hemisphere. Thank you very much. So I'm going to take some wise words from Stanislaw Dehan. Let me grab his book here. Reading in the Brain, which is where most of the stuff comes from. Um, this is wonderful, the wonderful Stanislaw Dehan. 
And I have a wonderful quote here. So I'm going to, usually I would ask for folks to chorally read the ta uh, text in red, but for the sake of time and because things are not always synchronous with our um, choral reading on our, online, I'll just read it. Reading is not a natural task and children are not biologically prepared to it by evolution, unlike spoken language. Thus, teachers must be aware that many of the reading steps that they take for granted, because they are expert readers, and let's face it, we're good at it, and have fully automated and non-conscious reading systems, are not at all obvious for young children. Massive changes are needed at the phonological and visual level before children master the skill of reading. So today we're going to talk about how you can help your children make those neural connections to make them great readers. The first thing we need to know, and this is going to be your mantra, is that children learn to read from speech to print. So we really do build on what they have happening in their brain from birth that comes naturally, which is speaking, and we build on speaking and then make that connection to print. So I'm going to ask you all to unmute and repeat that for me. Children learn to read from speech to print. Go for it. Children, Children learn, learn to read, to read from, from speech, speech to print. Excellent. Because we know that the, the neural pathways for speech can be developed just by being immersed in a language of, or in a culture of language. And so we want to use those and connect them to reading. And that's how we get proficient reading. So I've got a great slide here. Um, and this is um, a remake of uh, Stanislaw Dehan, which he has in his video that I actually linked here, his YouTube video about the reading brain. And I tried to recreate it. And so from a very young age, um, from birth actually, our, uh, these young babies are develop the, developing these phonological regions in their brain as they listen to and start to replicate the sounds in their environment. Um, a tidbit, all babies are born with the ability to make every single phoneme in every single language, which means at one point in my life, I was probably about two days old, I had the capability of rolling my R's. Unfortunately, I didn't use it, so I lost it, and it was pruned away. But phonological um, areas of our brain develop from birth, and so we want to be able to connect to those because that's how we're going to get fluent reading. So that's the yellow regions of our brain. Those are the phonological areas. Then we want to take a look at these meaning areas. So the meaning regions of our brain are also developing from birth. So as our students are building their oral lexicons, um, what's, what's happening is they're starting to make meaning from it. And so as they grow, they attach meaning to all the words that they've heard. And the last area of the brain to develop is the part that deals with the um, visual recognition of those letters. That part develops um, very last right here, and that's what we often refer to as the visual word form area. And I need someone to unmute and tell me, what, what does the visual word form area do from birth before it learns to read print? Because from birth, it's not reading print, it's reading something else. Do you know what, what it's reading? Anyone can you unmute and tell me? Anyone have an idea? Phonemes. It doesn't read phonemes back there because it isn't a visual region of our brain. It's in our visual cortex or occipital lobe. So it's back here in the back of my brain. Images, shapes. Close. It is images and shapes. But from birth, this part of the brain, so here's the left side of my brain. By the way, all of this happens on the left side of the brain. So here's my left side of the brain. And this visual word form area here from birth actually reads faces. And so what we have to do as neuroscientists and neurosurgeons is we're going to train that area of the brain to no longer read faces, but to start to read print. And that really um, can happen um, as our children are toddlers and moms and dads are reading aloud and pointing out print, but it also um, really explodes um, as our kids enter into preschool and our teachers in preschool are teaching print awareness, this is why print awareness is so important, so that this part of the brain shifts from reading faces to now saying, oh, that's an A, that's a B, that's an X, that's a Y. Um, and so that's why developing that print awareness and building print knowledge in preschool children is so important. And um, if your district is not using Sit Together and Read, I'll give a little plug for a free program. That's a wonderful curriculum supplement that's free. 
um, from the Crane Center at Ohio State University, and it's an excellent print awareness supplement to your curriculum to really develop this um, brain's letterbox here that is what recognizes print in our brain. But this develops last. So this is one of the last parts to, um, to develop in our brain. So therefore, we want to build on what's already been happening from birth, which are the speech areas of our print associated with phonology and meaning. And then we have to purposefully connect them to this visual word form area. That also is not, that, that pathway, those neural connections are not developed from birth. We have to make them connect to get a good reader. If we don't, then we have struggling readers. So like I said, all of this is happening on the left side of the brain. What side of the brain, everybody? Left. 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 Remember, if I'm the only one talking, I'm the only one learning. So I want to make sure that we're all talking this through. So yes, this is all going down on the left side of the brain. That's what happens in a good reader. Unfortunately, some of our struggling readers, because they are not making these connections, either through um, issues like dyslexia or unfortunately through dystichia, um, when they can't make those neural, neural connections on the left side of the brain, they try to compensate by tapping into the right side of the brain. So here we see a strong reader, and in my strong reader, the left side of the brain is lit up. All these areas, phonology, meaning, all the way back to the brain's letterbox here. We see this wonderful connection among re regions on the left side of the brain in strong readers. And then in poor readers, we see, unfortunately, areas of the brain on the right, which should not be involved in the reading process, trying to compensate. Now, here's the good news. With great intervention, we can get these compensators to slay the guessing monster and use the left side of their brain. But we need to offer the right interventions to those students as early as humanly possible, which is why early intervention is so important and why solid, great core instruction is so important as well. We want to make sure that the, right, that the uh, left side of the brain is lit up and not the right. So let's talk about rocket science versus neuroscience. Because as I mentioned before, Louisa Moat says that teaching reading is rocket science. Um, and if you talk to Mark Seidenberg or Stanislaw Dehaan, you'll know that teaching reading is also all about neuroscience. So let's take a look at what I'm talking about there. First of all, we have a lot of fads in education that have misled us. When I train teachers, the first thing I always say is, listen, we are all doing the best we can with the information we've been provided. The problem is that sometimes we're not provided the right information. And I know even myself, when I took this job, um, I originally took a job um, as a regional early literacy specialist before moving into my new role as Ohio Literacy Lead. And I thought I knew my stuff. But unfortunately, what I realized very quickly is I still had a lot to learn because I had not been given the correct information. And that's why I take it very personally to make sure that educators across our state and across the country have access to the, the best scientific information to use the science of reading and not fads. Um, Louisa Motes has said, it's not enough to just reflect on our practice. We need to know how the brain works. And a lot of education programs, they stress um, uh, being a reflective practitioner super important to be reflective on our practice, but it's not enough. If we don't know how the brain learns to read, then we're not going to be able to teach our students appropriately. And then to quote the great Louisa Motes, teaching reading is rocket science. If you haven't read the re-release of that article, I highly recommend you download it. It is free, just Google and it pops right up. Um, and the last thing that we need to know from a neuroscience perspective is that, our, as I mentioned before, our students are not born with the capacity for reading. We have to train the brain to read. So rather than just listening to me, I figured I would bring in um, virtually, via video, the greatest mind in the, in the world of neuroscience and literacy, the great Stanislaw Dehaan. So I put a link here to this video so you can share it with um, your colleagues as well. This video is called The Brain Puzzle. Super powerful about how we should use neuroscience to inform our practice and some of the things that we might be doing wrong. This child is learning to read. 
He's trying to rewire areas in his brain so it can turn shapes of letters on paper into sounds and words of spoken language. Actually, his teacher might not always be helping him because one common way of teaching probably just makes it harder to learn to read. Stanislas Dian knows this. He won the Brain Prize in 2014. He studies how reading takes place in the brain. He is a professor at Collège de France and the leader of INSERM CEA's Cognitive Neuroimaging Center in Sauclay, south of Paris. These laboratories are called Neurospin. In my lab, we are specializing in analyzing the functions of the human brain and especially the higher level functions such as reading, language, uh, mathematics, number processing, consciousness. Watching the brain at work requires finely tuned precision scanning instruments, as well as very carefully designed experiments if you want to make sure you're actually studying a certain function of the brain. This means the scientists in Diane's laboratory, in order to see how the brain reads, might construct a whole hierarchy of stimuli, ranging from real words all the way down to pseudo words, or even pseudo letters that look like letters but are meaningless symbols in any alphabet. In this way, we can isolate some of the brain processes by subtraction. We ask, what difference does it make if it's a word? What difference does it make if it's pronounceable? Uh, where in the brain is a specific process going on? So what actually happens in the brain when it reads? And what implications should it have for how reading should be taught? It turns out our brains build on the circuits we trained when we absorbed spoken language. In other words, to grasp the alphabet, the brain first must learn to speak. That is easy for a child. Over millions of years, evolution has hardwired the human brain structures for that purpose. We don't need to go to school to learn to speak. All we need is to experience a language. But evolution has never shaped the brain to read. No brain structures have been developed through evolution to make sense of letters and written words. We were never born in order to learn to read. It's an invention, it's very recent. What we do is we recycle some of the circuits of the ventral visual cortex. Some of these circuits are specialized for faces, for instance, but we turn them into circuits for recognizing letters and bringing this information about letters to the same exact circuit that is being used for spoken language. They know about the pronunciation of the word. And uh, especially when you're a beginner reader, uh, the challenge of reading is to turn the letters into sounds. So that's what this child's brain is struggling with, turning symbols on paper into sounds. Sounds that make sense because they are part of spoken language. But until he masters this conversion, he cannot focus on the meaning of the word. Now, as you become an expert reader, you become faster and faster in doing this conversion. You begin to be able to do it for an entire set of letters all at once, in parallel. So you no longer have the feeling that you're doing this slow conversion, but it's still going on in your head. These are findings that have implications for teaching all over the world because many children are trained to recognize whole words when they learn to read. That might not help the child at all. Well, there is a debate in the education literature about how to teach reading. There is this idea that maybe you just need to expose children to whole words or even whole sentences and they will absorb uh, the reading system. We know it's not the case and we know now that it's the other way, the explicit uh, teaching of correspondences between graphemes and phonemes, between letters and sounds, uh, which is the right way to teach reading, because this is the way to teach explicitly those circuits going directly from vision to uh, spoken language. Um, this is the preferred route for the brain. If you don't do that, if you draw attention to the whole word, uh, there are experiments showing that you are teaching another circuit, much more in the right hemisphere, which is, you know, the opposite side of the brain. Then you're not training the brain to read. The discovery of how the brain learns to read 
is an example of how scientific measurements of the brain can lead to better understanding of psychological processes like reading, mathematics, and other functions of consciousness. And it turns out, even mathematics can be taught in ways the brain finds more or less natural. As much as I would love to give you time to learn more about mathematics, <laughs> um, I am going to pause it there uh, because I want to continue on. But there was a lot of amazing insight in this video, and that's why I hope you share it with your colleagues. I would love for you to share in the chat box right now or unmute your mic. What are some of the big, huge takeaways, ahas, that you're going to highlight for your colleagues that came out of this video? You can either type in the chat box or unmute and talk. You know, I like it when people on mute and talk. I'll unmute because I can't t type on an iPad. <laughs> um, one of the, you know, as a school psychologist, one of my big takeaways from this is always, you know, for teachers, um, that there is only one way to learn to read. Like, um, you can't do what they have been doing um, in the way that they've been doing and expect to produce proficient readers across the board, but that doesn't necessarily mean that what they're doing is 100% wrong. It's just that you, there's a better way to do it and there's an evidence-based way to do it. And so I, I like this video in that it connects, you know, the areas of the brain to that explicit instruction that, you know, they will hopefully be doing with their students. Absolutely. And, and when it comes to that better way, you know, one of the big takeaways from this brain is, or from this video is, when we teach whole word memorization, we actually activate the, the right side of the brain, which is the wrong side for reading. So we don't want to teach whole word memorization. It's the wrong way to teach reading in that it activates the right side of the brain, not helpful. We want to activate the left side of the brain, tapping into um, those neural circuitry for phonology um, from speak, spoken language first so that they can then tap into that meaning. So I see another couple things in the chat. And Dr. Brobeck, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, that, you know, when you and I did the study of whole brain teaching in the early years of my study of neuroscience, we looked at how babies learn to talk. So this whole process of the brain having a systematic methodology of being able to do certain things. We know that they listen in Wernicke's area for about a year. We know they can distinguish language even though they can't speak it, and then suddenly they start to say words, and which leads into the whole concept of speech to print, in my view. Absolutely, it really does. Wernicke's area is great for our listening comprehension, and then we have Broca's up here, right, which is that pronunciation and articulation, and we need to tap into those regions when we're teaching our children to read. That's, yeah, you're right. That's the speech to print piece. Absolutely. Um, and Christina said whole word teaching may actually be a disservice to our students, and it really is. Um, it, when, we, when we use whole word teaching, um, we actually engage, again, that right side of the brain for whole word memorization. It's, that's what poor readers do. That's what struggling readers do. If you listen to Emily Hanford's At a Loss for Words, that's one of the things she talks about. And we know Annette said explicit instruction in this making those letter sound correspondences benefits all not just some there is no child that has ever been hurt by being taught the letter sound correspondences explicitly so it really is about all of our students i love um sarah said um once again we're not natural readers but that you have to first learn the sounds connecting those sounds to orthography um and that's going to be important before the meaning so the phonology really does happen first and I'll show you how that's modeled in um, the four-part processing system in a little bit. So great, great points. Excellent. Um, is whole word decoding good after decoding is done? What happens is it, our brain, well, you'll see that later. I, in fact, I'm, I'm going to put a pin in that question, Heather, um, because you are going to see as uh, we go through what kind of happens in the brain. And I'll, I'm going to address that in a little bit because I don't want to give away one of my cool questions. Okay. So a couple things that we learned from this video. Learning to speak is natural. Learning to read is not. Um, teachers need to know how the brain works to teach reading effectively so that we don't teach reading in a way that doesn't align to those neural pathways we need to develop in the left side of the brain. So knowledge for teachers is going to be powerful here. 
education changes the brain. From birth, our children develop the phon phonological and those meaning components. We need to connect them to the letterbox. Um, that's what happens when we teach. It does. We can't. They don't automatically connect to the letterbox unless we teach that. And if you recall, Dahan was holding up his little brain, and he was saying, you know. We take this region that reads faces, we teach it to recognize letters, but on its own, that's nothing. It's nothing until it connects with the rest of the brain associated with phonology and meaning. And my brain, I think, is cuter than Dahan's brain, you know, my little, but that's just me. Um, okay, so education does change the brain by developing that. And then I want to talk a little bit about neurorecycling because he mentions neurorecycling quite briefly. And what he's talking about is we neuro-recycle this part back here in the back of our left um, occipital lobe here. Um, this part of our brain, again, originally read faces. We neuro-recycle it in order to have it now read and recognize print. So Stahan says, because the brain is not involved for reading, I'm arguing that reading instruction evolve for the brain. We need to change our reading instruction based on how the brain learns to read. And if you want to change the system, you first need to know how it works. And that's why this PD is so important for teachers. So I'm going to kind of take you through the brain using this particular handout here. And I'm going to kind of draw this for you. Let me get my marker. As to what happens in the brain. Here we go. So the signal comes in through the eyes. It travels all the way back here to the back of the brain in the occipital lobe. Actually, it first goes right here to the occipital lobe, and then it immediately transfers it to this region right here, which is the part of the brain that reads letters. Does anyone remember what I said that part of the brain was called? The part of the brain that reads letters. Go ahead and unmute if you remember. Occipital lobe. But within the occipital lobe, it's the brain's letterbox. Or it's also called the visual, visual word form area. <laughs> it's sometimes also referred to as the visual, visual word form area or the brain's letterbox. So in this occipital lobe, what's this part of the brain called, everybody? The unmute. visual word form, word form area. area. Uh -huh. Or the brain's letterbox. Excellent. Wow. Nice. Nice. Okay. So that just reads the letters. That doesn't, I mean, that is not decoding. That is just recognizing that those are letters. So if the word is charge, it's like, okay, I see a C and H and A and R, G and E. And that doesn't even happen unless first my students have been given a lot of explicit instruction in that, right? Um, so now the signal has to make some really serious connections. Um, Dahan says it kind of explodes out into the temporal and frontal lobe. But I'm going to kind of draw a little bit more detailed pathway for you here. So that, those letters then have to connect here through the angular gyrus. What's this part of the brain called, everybody? The? Angular gyrus. Angular, angular gyrus, <laughs> yes. And within the angular gyrus, they, sometimes they refer to it as the fusiform gyrus, um, within the angular gyrus, we look at those letters and we say, okay, in the word charge, for example, CH, I'm going to put those together, that's CH, AR, that's R, GE, that's J, and so we have CH, R, J, and it maps the sounds that are all throughout this, these areas here for phonology, it maps those sounds to the letters in a millisecond. It happens so absolutely quickly, and then we think, oh, okay, that's a word I know, charge, so over here in my temporal lobe, I'm thinking about that's a word I've heard before. I know the meaning of it. In fact, I know lots of different meanings of that word charge. I can use my charge card. I can charge forward. Um, I, you know, we say charge or I just charge it or I have to charge my phone to give me more power. So we think here in our temporal lobe, we make these connections to all the storage we have all over the brain um, for meanings and context of charge. And then up here in Broca's area, as, Dave, as Dr. Robert was talking about, this is where we now are going to output and say charge. We're going to articulate each of those sounds. But all of these areas are connected, and they all connect in a millisecond, and that's what's so important. 
So I call this a slightly more simplistic view of the brain uh, because really when you see it, and I'm like going to show you a video a little bit, it, it looks pretty powerful and there's so many different regions, more so than even the four I just showed you. So this is Dehan's more um, detailed description. So he said we, we the signal comes in through the eyes, goes all the way back here um, to the occipital lobe, which immediately says, oh, that's print. Send it here to the visual word form area because that's print. And so now from the visual word form area, it explodes out. Dehan was very clear that first it connects to phonology, then it connects to meaning. First phonology, then meaning. As our children get older and more proficient in their reading, so that the phonology and the orthography happen together instantly, quickly, because they've already um, uh, automated that process of phonology to orthography. Once that happens, then this all really kind of happens almost together in a very beautiful symbiotic kind of movement. It's, it's quite beautiful, actually. And I'll show you a video of it here in a little bit. So you'll see that these arrows are all bi-directional because we are tapping into what is developed through speech and now we're adding in the print. And we as teachers are teaching the connectivity between the speech and the print. But very often in our instruction, we neglect to make the connection between the speech and the print, instead forcing whole word memorization, which now activates a completely different part of the brain, which is um, uh, inefficient for our readers. So let me show you what this looks like from the brain perspective. This is only a 30 second video of Dahan showing how this happens in the brain. Inside uh, the folds. And now I want to show you the activation of the brain as you read one word. We see it in time. So let me start this. Here we go. And you have the word unfolding from the back of the brain to the front of the brain. Uh, it will loop several times. You can see the information enters into the occipital pole, which is the visual side of the brain, moves into the... Kind of cool, right? So it enters in to the occipital lobe, goes to the visual word form area, and then just explodes into all of these other um, phonological and meaning regions. It goes to phonology first and then to meaning. But eventually, once students automatize, that's when that kind of happens a little bit more at the same time. But as we're still learning to read, we have to tap into phonology first and then to meaning. Phonology really does anchor orthography and meaning. It's critical for both, for storage of both. So when we read, we recognize the letters and we combine them into graphemes. How does the brain learn to do that? By connecting them back to the phonemes or the sounds. So when we connect these letters and or graphemes to the speech sounds, that's when we're actually decoding the words. We then connect to the meaning processors to recognize these words and think about all the, the ways from an oral language perspective we've heard and used these words in our, our oral lexicons. The areas for speech sounds and meaning, they already existed in our children's brains from spoken language. So we want to tap into that. And the great thing is, and keep this in mind as you're doing read-alouds, we use the same parts of the brain for spoken language and written language when it comes to speech and meaning. So read alouds are that much more important because we are still strengthening the reading brain when they're just listening and talking about text. Um, so that's going to be critical as we implement more read alouds into our instruction. So reading is really about creating this interface between visual and then the spoken language system and it causes a change in our brain after our children have learned to read. We develop neural pathways. We develop a super highway in the brain called the arcuate fasciculus. And when we do that, again, we're neuroscience, we're neurosurgeons, we have changed the brain. Kind of cool, right? I'm not seeing a whole lot of questions come through right now, so I wanna just pause for a second and see if there's anything that I can explain further, misunderstandings in terms of that before I move on. I'm Michelle, get I, may, I was wondering if you address this, is whole world good, is whole world word good after decoding? So I'm not gonna address that yet, okay. because what happens is, it, I wanna get you to this question, and then I, there's a poll question coming up that's going to kind of address that. But yes, well, we're going to talk about how that works, the impact of that in a second. So this is that more simplistic view, and I'm going to turn on my annotations here for a second, and I'm going to try and draw on the screen, so bear with me. So again, the signal comes in, goes all the way back here to occipital lobe, 
which says, oh, wait a second, that's a letter. So we go here to our brain's letterbox or visual word form area. What's that part of the brain called? Brain's letterbox. Brain's letterbox. Brain's letterbox. Brain's letterbox. Absolutely. So signal comes in, comes back here. They say, oh, those are letters. And so now we go to the brain's letterbox. And then you see this explosion into the rest of the brain. But the first thing it connects to is what? Phonology or meaning, everybody? We take those letters. Phonology. Phonology. Phonology, right. And that's happening here in the angular gyrus. And we know with children with dyslexia, that's one of the areas that that connectivity has not been well developed. So we need to offer additional explicit instruction to develop that connectivity. But when we make sure we develop that connectivity in all students from preschool on, we can actually prevent the um, identification as children of, with uh, learning disabilities because we're going to make sure that connectivity happens. We can actually prevent some students from, being, um, from qualifying as children with learning disabilities by teaching, reading, and core instruction the right way. So um, uh, some folks call it dysteachia. Reed Lyon calls it NBT, never been taught. But we can make sure that we teach this to prevent that over-identification of children. And in children with dyslexia, when we make sure that we provide additional instruction, first of all, we lessen the severity. Second of all, we can actually ensure that, those, um, that, that we remediate the issues of dyslexia by making these connections for them in their brain, because that's one of the things where the breakdowns is. So they might need a little additional explicit instruction, making those speech sound to graphene correspondence connections, but we can very much and very easily remediate that. Um, the worst thing to do is, again, ask them to start memorizing whole words and to guess. We want to slay the guessing monster. So after we connect to phonology, again, we've got this wonderful explosion into meaning. As our students become more automatic with letter sound correspondences, what happens is um, the, the phonology and meaning start to happen at the same time. But that's when our students become much more automatic. Okay, I've kind of drawn all over this slide. Let's move on. So remember I mentioned that um, superhighway, that neural pathway that we want to be so automatic in the brain? And we call that super path, uh, superhighway the arcuate fasciculus. And really, it's just a neural pathway that's traveled so much in the brain. And you'll notice it goes from these meaning to phonology pieces, really kind of taking it from back here where we have our brain's letterbox and then transitioning. So we need to take the arcuate fasciculus and make sure that we connect it to the brain's letterbox and get that on the superhighway for our students. We develop that through a lot of practice. The more practice we do in the developing brain, the more this superhighway, the arcuate fasciculus, really does become an automatic process in the brain. By the way, what's the superhighway called, everybody? The? Arcuate fasciculus. Fasciculus. Kind of cool. I love that. I love those two words. I just think they're fun. <laughs> so, as students become more proficient, they process sounds and meaning in parallel, but that develops that automaticity through the arcuate fasciculus before that happens. It, we begin with tapping into phonology first, then meaning, but as they become more proficient readers, the phonology and meaning become more parallel of a process. Again, arcuate fasciculus enables that. So what the heck does this mean for my instruction? Well, I really love to use this graphic of the four-part processing system from um, Mark Seidenberg. Um, and then um, it's been uh, had some definite con contributions from others over time. Seidenberg, McClellan, Adams talks about this a lot. And these are the four processing regions in our brain that we need to make sure our instruction taps into. And the important thing to remember with all of this is we start at the bottom and we work our way up. Where do we start, everybody? The bottom. At the bottom at the bottom and then work our way up. Why? Because that's what happens in our brain. Remember, the signal comes in and we start to think about the orthography, the letters, the print, but we can't really, um, we can't really associate them with, with graphemes yet until we first connect those graph, those letters um, to the sounds. So our orthographic processor is really strengthened through its connection to the phonology or the phonological processor. When we take those letters and we connect them to sounds, now they become graphemes. So that's how we get a great memory 
um, not only for letters, but also then for the individual graphemes so we can decode in a millisecond. Um, so the orthographic processor is about individual letters, and it's also about grouping letters together, to, together as in the word charge, to say, oh, CH, that's one grapheme. Um, GE, that's one grapheme. AR, that's one grapheme. Why? Because they represent one sound. And then we know the phonological processor is really all about the sound processing, language input, and language output. Then we move into that connection to meaning. And this is stored, um, we retrieve this through the left temporal lobe, although meaning storage is all over the brain. We store meaning for words everywhere in our brain. But we retrieve it through the left temporal lobe to connect it to the phonology and orthography. And then last but not least, but it is last, is context. So, um, you know, there's a lot of controversy about context. Context is strengthened through background knowledge, and it's really important to have context. But we don't start there. We end there. We make the connection then to context last. It's the backup processor. It's how we check to make sure we did things well. So let me show you how I would use this to plan my instruction. Oh, by the way, when all these things work together beautifully, that is when we get fluency. When all the processors are communicating in a beautiful, amazing way, with, we get fluency because it's automatic in our brain. But I want to kind of show you how we use this to plan for our instruction. And you may have seen me do this before. Let me clear my drawings. So, for example, when I'm teaching that word charge, right? You know, I want to teach that word charge. You notice I'm tapping into speech to print. I say the word and I tell them um, the word is charge. And this is how I would teach any word. Um, I'm really tapping into that phonological processor because remember, it developed first. That's our, you know, um, we learn to read from speech to print. Then I might say, let's think about the sounds in charge. We have charge, charge. There are three sounds. And because there are three sounds, I've got three boxes here. Now I need to, so I've tapped into phonology well, but I need to then connect phonology. So let's go back here. I tapped into phonology. I need to connect it to orthography. Those two have to be connected. So now I'm going to look at, okay, well, the ch sound is represented by CH. Letters don't make sounds. Letters represent sounds. The sounds were there first. <laughs> then we have that R sound, the pirate sound is what I always tell my kids. And that's represented by these letters, A-R. A-R is saying R. C-H is saying ch. So we have ch, R. What was that last sound again? It was j. And that's represented by these letters, G-E. Um, and we have this E here so that the G says its name and it has a purpose. So now I've made this really great connection between phonology and orthography. And I want to do that to build a strong foundation, you see here. Now I'm going to move up into meaning. And we could talk about all the different meanings of the word charge. And, um, but those meanings rely on context. And that's why meaning and context work so beautifully together. Um, because you really can't process meaning unless you're making that connection to context. And so we kind of um, handle both of those um, together. And so I would talk about the meaning maybe in my text uh, versus other meanings for charge. And they're all going to be associated with different contexts when I'm charging my phone or if I'm going to charge it on my credit card when I'm shopping or charge forward. So um, the, all of these working together gives us fluency. Oh boy, checking my time. Ooh, running out of it. So this is where we would really talk about whether you agree or disagree that once the students learn letter sound correspondences, can they self-teach for fluency? Because we do have, you know, share self-teaching theory. Once students learn letter sound correspondences, um, do you agree or disagree? Can they self-teach for fluency? And this I is disagree. purposefully ambiguous. <laughs> Go ahead and type in the chat box or I'm mute to talk. No. Uh, some Can you repeat the question? We had someone come in our office. That's okay. Do you agree or disagree with this statement and why? Once students learn letter sound correspondences, can they self-teach for fluency? Yes. And it's purposely a vague and ambiguous question and that the answer could really be both. <laughs> 
here's why. There are some students who, once we provide that really great structure, they roll with it, right? And they, um, the self-teaching, they just start, the brain becomes a self-teaching pattern-seeking mechanism. And so we know that for some students, with, once we give them this strong foundation in orthographic mapping, they just roll with it, right? But fluency, um, orthographic mapping, that connection of sounds to print, is one of the best ways to reach fluency. Absolutely the best way. Um, but fluency is not just the bypass product of the letters and the sounds. Um, as we take a look at um, Jan Hasbrook is kind of like the guru of all things fluency. It really is about accurate reading. So there's our letters and sounds, but it's also about rate. It's about expression, um, that prosody. You know, prosody really matters when we read. And so there are some other components, um, as well as having an understanding of what those words mean. When students don't know what the words mean, um, sometimes their fluency breaks down. So um, fluency then leads to great comprehension and motivation. But there's more to fluency, as you saw in the four-part processor, than just letter sound correspondences. That's the strong foundation, but we need to make sure we move through all four processing systems. So that's why I said that question could be yes or no, because it really can. So here's the question I get all the time. Well, then what the heck's the role of vision? Because one, you know, well-intentioned teachers use whole word memorization um, because they really do think it's a visual process. Learning to read is not just a visual process. It's a, it's a phonological, orthographic, and um, meaning process. There's a lot happening there. But vision does play a role. So what is the role of vision? We'll take a look here. Here we go, the first thing. Visual memory is really helpful for learning letters. So in preschool, as we're just starting to introduce, introduce our students to learn their letters, visual memory is going to be important, which is why we really want to str um, focus on how those letters are formed, and we teach correct letter formation, and we have them draw them, and we have visual reminders of the letters everywhere, right? Um, so that's going to be critical um, for learning letters. Visual memory absolutely plays a role. The other thing to keep in mind is that letter reverse, because visual memory plays a role in letter recognition, letter reversals are common for all kids. Letter reversals do not mean dyslexia. Let me say that again. Letter reversals do not mean dyslexia. Letter reversals happen because from birth, our children are taught that no matter how it sits, it is what it is. So I am Michelle. Whether I'm standing like this, I'm bent over like this, I'm standing like that, or I'm standing on my head, which by the way, I can't do. Um, this is a marker, whether it's like this, like this, like this, or like this, it's still a marker. And our children learn that from birth. However, then we teach them print, which means we've got to rewire the brain to suddenly recognize letters, right? And when we teach them um, about print, we're rewiring the brain and we say, okay, look, this is the letter B, right? Stick, hump, B, yay! But now guess what? Now it's a different letter. Now it's the letter P. And guess, what? now I can make it into, I can make it into a Q or a G. As I move this letter around, it becomes different things, even though it's the exact same visual letter. And so it goes against everything my children have been taught. And I'd probably better example if I showed you under the thing. So here we go. We teach our kid, stick with the hump on it is a B, right? But then when we move the, we change the formation, now it's a D. Oh, I'm gonna change the formation one more time. Now it's a P. And I'm gonna change the formation one more time and now it's a Q. It's no wonder it's confusing for our children. They have learned their entire life that no matter how I place this pencil, it's still a pencil, but when it comes to letters, how I place it matters. So it is going to be challenging. It's a natural thing. There are wonderful resources that your teachers can access to help with that, but really it just takes practice. Readsters and Michael Hunter, they've got some great um, free resources to help with letter reversals. Um, but it really is just about that practice with those letters and the letter formation to help them. We've got to strengthen, as neuroscience scientists and neurosurgeons, that occipital lobe in the visual word form area. Okay, 
Handwriting is super important in this process because with handwriting, now we're adding in a multi-sensory visual motor component that's really going to help with letter recognition. So if you're not teaching handwriting, get on it. The handwriting also later leads to better language comprehension skills when it comes to writing, the writing process once we've automatized handwriting. And last but not least, the motor sequence in handwriting matters when we teach, is le when we teach letters. So that's that visual component combined with the motor component. We do want to teach the right handwriting structure and sequence, which is why a good handwriting program is something that should be on your must-have list for your school. But the one thing that vision does not play a role in is visual memory, is the actual um, memory of sight words. Sight words are not based on visual memory. So although vision plays a role in letter recognition, it has no role in sight word recognition. So memorizing sight words is not going to be helpful for a developing reader. Sight word recognition is really based on phonology. So if we think about this, again, visual memory does not play a role in word recognition, but phonology does. Remember, we, map, we take in those letters, and then we map them to the phonemes, and then we connect them to meaning. And that's how we want to make sure that we teach our children to read. We need to map the phonemes to the graphemes for long-term storage. That's orthographic mapping. That's how we store words, at least in good readers. So we store and then retrieve those words through orthography. So those are the graphemes. Phonology, connecting those to the phonemes, and then connecting to meaning. All three are going to matter. It's not just visual memorization. Phonology, though, is critical for that retrieval. Uh, Anita Archer says phonology anchors to the orthography. Phonology anchors to the meaning. So when we teach vocabulary, we always want to stress the phonology because that helps store the meaning, but it also helps store how it's spelled. Um, the phonology maps those orthographic patterns in our words. So remember how I said that that part of the brain that reads the letters is called the brain's letter box. Well, if you think of a post office box, you know, so that, you know, those big things that you put the mail in. Once you put the mail in there, it shuts and you can't get the mail back out. Even if you try to pull it open, you can't get your hand in there to get the mail back out. That's what phonology does for our brain's letter box. It helps to ensure that those graphemes go in there and get stored permanently. So it then becomes automatic when we read. And that's why um, we have um, readers who appear to read without any issue. And um, it kind of looks like that whole word reading. But until we properly understand how to promote permanent word storage, we'll continue to have a lot of weak readers. So when we teach, we have to tap in to all of these processing systems. That is going to be critical for teaching children to read. The other reason I like to stress this four-part processing system is a tool to slay the guessing monster. And so I want you to rethink what you do when a student comes to a word they don't know. So if a student is reading text, they come to a word they don't know in the text. Rather than saying, read ahead and guess based on context. Remember, we don't start at the top. We start down here at the bottom. We're going to say, look at all those letters. Sound it out. So now we're going to connect the orthography and phonology. Look at the letters, sound out the word. Is that a word you know? And does it make sense here? So we're going to start at the bottom and work our way up. By the way, I've got this written down for you right here. Look at all the letters, sound it out. Is that a word you know? Check yourself, does it make sense? So use the four-part processing model as a guide to help our students as well. And what about the role of context? Context has no role in decoding, it's the backup. But in comprehension, context really helps us to understand what we're reading. So comprehension's role is here. So let me get my, um, I have a, a lovely little stamp. Um, context is really important here in comprehension. But context does not have a strong role in decoding, it's the backup, it's how we check our work. And I, Tim Shanahan has a really nice blog on this topic as well. Okay, so now to get to that question about when is it good to teach whole word reading. Good readers, when we read, so all of you, when you read, do you process language word by word or letter by letter? And I'm gonna, I have a poll for that. Let me get that. Oops. Gotta go back to my mouse. 
That's the problem with those drawings. I want to use them all the time. Okay, so let's open up a poll. Here we go. When you read, do you process written language word by word or letter by letter? Go ahead and vote. I'm still missing some votes. I only have about half of you have voted. And Michelle, while you're waiting, I want to give a shout out to Liz Hansen from New Zealand that oh, I believe really? it is maybe four o'clock or five o'clock in the morning there. She just got up to join us. Well, welcome, Liz. So glad that you're here. Thank you. That's amazing. So when good readers read, I'm still missing seven people. I need seven people to vote. Oh, I've got some in the chat box. I've got a few B's in the chat box. Okay, I'm going to end the poll. And I'm going to broadcast your results. And the majority of you did get this right. The correct answer is letter by letter. Even the best readers take in each and every letter. That's the reason that we can distinguish the word blink from the word blank. And unfortunately, dysteachia teaches our children to try to process it as whole words, and we actually train the brain to do the wrong thing, which is not take in each and every letter. And uh, that happened to my son when he was reading, um, and this was a couple years ago, but he said, um, oh, that's a, that's a fright train. And I said, no, honey, that's not a fright train. It's a freight train. But because he'd been taught to memorize whole words, luckily he was a he was one of the lucky ones. He kind of learned to internalize a lot of the rules himself. His brain had been trained to do the wrong thing, which was not take in each and every letter. And so that's why he said um, the freight train and not the freight train. And we've had multiple examples that I shared a lot of my training where that has happened for my kids. Um, but we want good readers take in each and every letter, which is why we can see the difference between house and horse, between blink and blank. Um, we recognize each and every one, which is why teachers spot a spelling error a mile away and it kind of bothers them, right? Um, we see each and every letter. The thing is, we do it very quickly. And so I've got a little quote here from Dahan. The concurrent or the current thinking is that during reading of a single word, millions of hierarchically organized um, neurons, each tuned to a specific local property, a letter, a bigram, or a morpheme, collectively contribute to visual recognition. This creates the illusion of whole word reading. Because reading is so fast and takes about the same time for short and long words, we have assumed, at least uh, Anita Archer says, committing a suicide, that the overall word shape is being used for recognition, and therefore we should teach whole word reading rather than letter to sound. The inference is wrong. We memorize, we store words by connecting speech to print, by connecting the phonemes to the graphemes, and then making meaning. So we need to make sure that we teach it phonemes connected to graphemes. That is how we'll build that strong, strong foundation for our students. So to answer your question, I'm never going to teach students to memorize whole words. Um, someone, teachers always ask me, um, can, when can I use a flashcard? If you have taught the letter sound correspondences and taught it well, um, I read um, from Ari, you need at least four exposures, four to six, to really make that stick to the brain. Then we can go back and practice for retrieval. And um, actually, in his book, Equipped for Reading Success, um, uh, Kilpatrick has some great look-alike words, and he said if you're going to do fla um, flashcards to uh, practice after you've taught it, use these look-alike words like blink and blank. So my students have to continue to, to recognize each and every one of those letters and to distinguish the difference. So in the back of his book, he's got pages of look-alike words that we should use as part of that process. Does that answer that question? Hopefully. But I'm going to get you here because we're, we're almost at the end. Of, oh, we are at the end of time. But what about read-alouds? Well, read-alouds are very critical for building word recognition and language comprehension. Why? Because that's the area on our left hemisphere that we use for phonology and meaning um, for speaking is activated when we read aloud a book to our children. And so those are the same regions involved in reading. So we're activating 
some of the very same parts of our brain when we read aloud. Um, and so, okay, so Heather Ross said, can I explain the neuro neurology for um, Elkonin boxes? First of all, when we use, um, Elkonin boxes are never shaped. Those are not Elkonin boxes. But this process that we used to do that is absolutely wrong. So we used to teach this. And there are some well-respected people and researchers who still do this. They, they actually have boxes that look like this. Um, and actually, it's completely wrong. Louisa Motes talked about it in the Rita Palooza um, video. This is a myth, and it's wrong. It's been de debunked by neuroscience. This is absolutely not a good way to teach children to read. Elkonin boxes are these, which you see here, and they're all the exact same shape and size, and each box represents a sound, not a letter. So Elkonin boxes are not shaped. These are based on sounds, so each of these represents a sound or a phoneme. So for example, the word cheese, three sounds, three boxes. And it has nothing to do with the visual shape of that word. So that's a great question. Thank you so much. But I do want to stress that read alouds are incredibly important for our students. And we should be using them each and every day to strengthen those phonological and meaning processors. But we need to have a purpose for them. Um, are we building background knowledge? Are we teaching print awareness? Are we using for social emotional? What are we using them for? Are we pre-teaching vocabulary? I hope so. Um, use text with academic language to further strengthen those neurological pathways. Read aloud both a 50-50 mix of narrative and informational texts. And make sure that they are very challenging above their grade level. That's how we're going to help make better readers. Um, because we want to build that background knowledge, which Hirsch talks about a lot. We also know in little babies that when we read aloud, we activate the arcuate fasciculus. So we see here that arcuate fasciculus is developed when we read aloud to a small baby. But when they don't get read alouds um, and they are just in, um, put on technology, we see underdevelopment in those reading areas. But when we read aloud, we see overdevelopment. So wash your children in waves of words. Read alouds, oral language, really critical. I'm so sorry I went over, but I'm going to review the last couple points for today. Hopefully you all know the parts of the brain involved in reading, the role of the four-part processing system, how to really teach sight words, the role of phonology, and the importance of read-alouds. I'm going to ask that you evaluate me today. Let me know how I did. I know I did have to rush and I apologize at the end, but hopefully this was helpful. I'm happy to stay on and answer any questions you might have. But for the sake of time, I want to let those go who need to go. And here's the evaluation for today. Let me know if you need a certificate in the evaluation. Thanks, everybody.